Let's talk about how the YouTube algorithm actually works. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there about the inner workings of the algorithm. And this leads to a lot of creators making wrong decisions based on this understanding. So by making this video, I'm hoping to clarify a lot of this misinformation and paint a simple picture of how the YouTube algorithm actually works so that you can adjust according to that. And especially if you're putting a lot of time in analyzing your content. I do have to give credit to people like Todd who have helped me better understand the YouTube algorithm because this definitely wasn't my effort alone. Let's begin with the big misconception. When people think about the algorithm, they often think it's a reactive model. What I mean with this is that a lot of people think when you upload a video, it gets pushed to an initial audience, and then based on the reaction of that audience, it's going to decide whether to push it to a further audience or not. Now, unfortunately, with this model, there's a lot of inefficiencies because what if that initial audience wasn't even the target audience in the first place? But also, what if the timing of this content piece wasn't right and next month people would enjoy it a lot more? Then those initial performance results shouldn't be affecting this one. So by having a reactive model, you run into a lot of issues and that's the reason why this was not the choice that YouTube went with. And again, we are talking about the long-form content algorithm, the one that people often talk about. Now, what's really happening here is that YouTube decided on a predictive model. This is different because what YouTube is going to do, rather than instantly pushing it and testing and comparing each video, it's going to take a lot of information from the users, a lot of information from the video, and try to create a good connection. Now, that's a simple way to put this one, and I often li like to call it interest connecting. But in this video, we're going to go a lot deeper and look at each step involved to make this predictive model happen. So if you're wondering why YouTube is so good at figuring out that whenever you start watching live streams that you are most likely liking live streams and when you start watching cooking videos that other food related videos are probably of your interest, this is going to explain that. So now let's take a look at how the system actually works. And we're gonna do that in three distinct steps. We're first going to talk about the collection and refining of data. Then we're gonna talk about something called candidate generation. And in the last step, we're going to talk about ranking and recommendation. So let's take a look at each step. Beginning with the collecting and refining data. In this step, we're going to take a look at three categories of data. And this is all just to give you an idea of how complex the YouTube algorithm actually is. So on the bottom layer, you have your raw data. And your raw data could be data such as interest data or anything related to engagement, anything related to satisfaction, maybe some behavioral data points or any other data points that are very easy to measure. They don't require any calculation. So let's take a look at each and every single one of them. If we look at interest data, we can look at the amount of impressions a video got. We could also look at the amount of time somebody clicked on the thumbnail. Maybe for interest, we could even look at did somebody look at the autoplay and how long did they look at autoplay. Next up, we can look at engagement data. Now engagement data would be how long did you watch a certain video? How long did a user watch this specific video? How many viewers have completed the experience of an entire video? And even, let's say we get user A, how many hours or how many minutes do they spend on YouTube on average? It's just collecting very measurable data. That's the idea behind this raw data. With satisfaction, we can look at likes, dislikes, comments, or any other type of engagement. Behavioral data, we could look at what's the time of day that it is right now when the user logs in. Where are they from? Or even what device are they watching from right now? Yes, this eventually results into different recommendations based on whether you're watching from your phone, your computer, or your television. And even under raw data, there's many other measurable data points that are simply measuring what the user is doing or what they're not doing if they're not clicking away and then collecting this as raw data points. But this brings us to the second level of data, which is not so much raw data anymore, but it's more a level of refined data. Often this is referred to as features. Let me give you an example of a few of these features or refined data. When we take a look at the impressions and the amount of views that a video got, we can easily use these two raw data metrics to make a calculation and this gives us CTR or click-through rate it becomes the likelihood that somebody is going to click on a certain video when it's served. For example, if a video has a million impressions, this raw data point, and 100,000 views, then you have 
10% CTR. But it goes way further than those kind of things. The YouTube will understand your title and will have a grasp of what the video is going to be about. Or it can even read into your video and look at everything you're talking about and then try to distill which type of topics you're discussing in this video. All of this data is to create more data from the raw data that we initially measured. So raw data is very much about the measurement and this is very much about refinement and creating new metrics that YouTube could be utilizing. And then if we go to the tip of this pyramid, we can find a third level of data. Even with the metrics that we have just created, from this raw data, we can create new metrics. So we can predict a CTR based on the time of day and combine that into potential CTR on a Friday. And there's so many options here. If we want to name all these levels, I would call the base level our raw data, the second level feature engineering, because we're engineering these features. And then whenever we go very complex, we can create advanced feature engineering. Whatever you want to call it, it's a great way to think in these three levels. But now we've got all this data. The YouTube algorithm has figured out what time of day you like to watch a certain anime collection or what kind of music you want to listen to when you're in the gym. And trust me, it knows you're in the gym. So we have all this and how does this now come back to the YouTube algorithm and the suggestions? Now before we can go to the second step of the YouTube algorithm, I first have to have a little bit in between talking about what happens when a video gets uploaded. And this is important in order to understand step number two, which is candidate generation. So whenever you upload a video on YouTube, Many people thought it was going to be pushed automatically to an audience. This is not what happens. Instead, you have to kind of see it as when you upload a video, it goes into a collective, into a group, a bucket, kind of in a storage. And YouTube understands this video. And then only when a user logs in onto YouTube, then YouTube is going to be like, hey, which video do I believe is the best to serve to this viewer? So again, this is a misconception. A lot of people think it's videos being pushed to viewers, while in reality, it is users logging in onto YouTube and YouTube kind of scrambling around and thinking which is the best video for me to serve. So that being said, that's a little intermezzo, but let's now get to step number two, candidate generation. So candidate generation is the idea that we're going to be looking at this massive database of videos and trying to figure out when the user logs in, which video should be served to this user. It's about selecting out of a group of thousand potential videos and then bring it down to a minimal that you get to see whenever you log in. Or not just when you log in, when you use a search feature or anything else. So again, this one we can divide down into three distinct steps. First, when a viewer logs in onto YouTube, what YouTube is going to do initially is select a smaller sample size from its billions of videos that the viewer could potentially be interested in. This is like a very wide net it costs with a lot of possible options for the specific viewer. Now, if they use the search function, it becomes a lot easier to target specific videos. But let's say we're just talking about the homepage. You log in and YouTube just casts this really wide net and collects thousands of videos you could be interested in. It's gonna do this based on many factors. So for example, it's going to look at the channels you're subscribed to. So let's take all those videos and put them in our list with candidates. Then we're going to take a look at which channels or video types you have watched recently. So let's say you've watched a tech video recently. It's going to take a bunch of very good tech videos that it believes will fit you as a user. We're going to also take a look at similar users. Let's say there is people like you and they really like a hundred of these videos. It's going to collect that too. And there's a lot more other little things that YouTube's algorithm could be looking at. But the idea is to create this big collective bucket of thousands of videos that you could potentially be interested in. Now, once it has this one, which there is a little bit of a selection process here, that's when YouTube is going to slowly start evaluating, which is in the second step. We have these thousands of videos now, but YouTube cannot just serve all of them. And this is where we're gonna start evaluating the candidates. What YouTube is going to do is it's going to try to predict how you're gonna interact with these videos. Are you gonna like them or not? What's the likelihood that whenever this video serves to you that you're gonna actually click on it? It's gonna also predict the amount of length that you're gonna watch this video. This is where the expected watch time per impression comes from. But also maybe sometimes you're in the mood for older videos and then YouTube is going to be like, you know what, all these newer videos, probably the user is not gonna be interested in those at this specific time. So it's going to slowly make a prediction whether you're going to like certain videos or not. And that brings us to a way smaller sample size. 
Then from that one is the third step, and that's what's called filtering. Obviously, we could still have thousands of videos or hundreds of videos, and that's still a little bit much for the usual experience because you're not planning to watch 100 videos. We're gonna look at smaller little details such as irrelevant videos that may not be as good for you right now. So it's going to go very granular until we get a very small data set that we could be working with. And all of this brings us to the final part of the algorithm, which is ranking and recommendation. Now, yes, after all this filtering, after all this collecting of potential candidates, we need to decide which video goes in that first slot, that second slot, that third slot, etc, etc. So we're gonna take, let's say, 100 videos that are left over and YouTube is going to rank them based on what this person is most likely to watch. We also want to make sure to rank it a little bit based on the time of day or how long you've been watching YouTube. And even it's going to try to make sure that the feed that you get to see is varied enough. So let's say you are a person who likes the game League of Legends and in that bucket of 100 videos, there's a lot of League of Legends videos. It's going to try to make sure that not every recommendation is League of Legends. Because what if at that moment you actually were not interested in League of Legends, but something else? This is the thing about humans. Humans aren't just interested in one thing. Often we have an obsession for a certain thing at that time, but maybe you like to know how many slaps it takes to cook a chicken. Well, that's nothing to do with League of Legends, but it creates a varied feed. So yes, YouTube doesn't always know what kind of mood you are in. So by having a more varied feed, it's going to make sure or increase the chances that you're actually gonna click on a video, start your watch session and stay on YouTube. And then there is still this special slot of videos that only have like 100 or 500 views that are like two days old. This is a little bit different. It works in a very similar system, but that's an exploration slot. There are videos on YouTube that YouTube doesn't have a lot of data about or newer creators. By reserving one slot, YouTube can have a less thorough analysis and just test out new content and see is there an interest for this new creator or this new type of video and that way it's able to collect a lot of data from that. But as you can see, this brings us all back to how the YouTube algorithm actually works. It's going to put the videos in this massive bucket and then whenever you log in, it's going to take from that bucket some candidates. Then it's going to slowly refine it based on predictions such as expected watch time per impression or whatever is important for the viewer and the platform at the time, which is completely different than the reactive model of just test and compare. Now, technically speaking, we could also say that there is a fourth step involved. However, this one is not really about the inner workings. This is more a refinement step about how the algorithm optimizes itself. So if we say there is a fourth step, it would be refinement. Now, obviously, whenever YouTube recommends things, they do get user data and they learn from how good their predictions were. This is different than test and compare, where we're just throwing it towards some audience. No, instead, what we're doing is we're predicting an audience, we're predicting a performance, what is a good match between a video and a user, and then we're going to see, was this a good prediction? And based on this, the algorithm is able to slowly adjust accordingly. So when people talk about the algorithm changing, there is two options possible. Maybe the algorithm is just starting to adjust according to user preferences. Whenever you see that there's more longer content being shown, then maybe the algorithm is learning that longer content is being preferred. But there's gonna be years that shorter content is being preferred. Now, YouTube does have an influence because at the end of the day, YouTube does want to achieve a certain thing. Sometimes they may want to achieve that people stay on the platform for longer. However, there's times, and recently they've been putting a lot of effort towards it, they may just want user satisfaction to go up. And it's always a combination. So when you hear the algorithm changes, the algorithm doesn't really change at the core. It's just, what is the algorithm trying to achieve? Are we trying to get people longer on the platform? Are we trying to give them a more satisfied experience? Is that a satisfied experience for like a week? Or maybe we're looking over the user over years. And this all slowly adjusts, but I can tell you this, I've talked enough with YouTube themselves to say they do have users' interest at their heart and are always trying to optimize the system. And I'm not saying this to defend YouTube, I would call them out if they have some bullshit going on. But again, they do want the right thing for both the creator as well as the user. It's just algorithms tend to behave in a certain way. So when you don't get recommended, it's not always because 
you weren't pushed towards an audience. It is just that the algorithm predicted that the user wouldn't like your content. But, and this is how I wanna finish this video, if your content is really good, when YouTube is predicting it, some users will like your content. And the reaction of those users is overwhelming in a positive way. Then the algorithm may re-reflect and understand, hey, this video actually is better than I thought. And it's going to readjust its own systems and then start recommending it to people. This is the reason why some videos blow up after 30 days, 60 days, or even a year later. Because there is a time and place for a video to blow up if it is a good video. So even though this was a fairly simplified way of explaining how the YouTube algorithm actually works, hopefully it painted a better picture for you to understand how it works. And that at the end of the day, if you understand what the objective is of the algorithm and you make content that humans really like, what interests them, engages them, and creates a satisfying, potentially even memorable experience. Your content will be served to the right audience. Now, if you like this video, let me know about this. If there's any other complex topics you wouldn't want me to go in depth into, I wanna do more of these. Now, all that being said, thank you so much for watching. If there's anything that you want me to cover next in depth, please let me know and I may make a video about it. And while I've got you here for these 10 seconds, I will put on screen some other videos that I think you will find interesting. And also, if you want more information or you want to really learn about retention, I've got a link in the description. I encourage you to check it out. There's some free masterclasses that you could check out or more if you are already an established creator. I'll see you in the next one.